at a moment like this, I find myself thinking back to the days when we first launched the nation. That was more than half a century ago. It's hard to believe sometimes that it has been that long. And frankly, it is even harder to believe that so much time has passed since my childhood days here in Kenya and my continuing early visits to this country. When I think back to the founding of the nation, and when I reflect on how much has changed and how far we have come, I think especially about the hopes and the dreams with which we launched this company. Our goal then was to create a news medium that belonged to the whole of the nation of Kenya. And that, of course, is why we chose our company name. That dream moved ahead in a big way when we took the company to the public shareholding market so that today a majority of the nation's shares are owned by the general public of Kenya. Our additional central goal at the time of our founding was to create a news medium that would be truly independent, a place where the public could find a voice it could trust, an objective and thoughtful voice a voice that would tell people what the facts are as reliably as possible. Our goal was not to tell people what to think, but to give them reliable information so that they could think more clearly for themselves. All over the world, the number of media voices is exploding. Websites, bloggers, and social media voices multiply every day. The result is often a wild mix of messages. Good information, bad information, superficial impressions, fleeting images, and a good deal of confusion and conflict. And this is true all over the world. On top of that, this is also a time when public emotions and political sentiments are intensifying and even polarizing again all over the world. The result, some people say, is that we live in a post-fact society. Yes, a post-fact society. It's not just that everyone feels entitled to his or her own opinion. That's a good thing. But the problem comes when people feel that they are entitled to their own facts. What is true too often can then depend not on what actually happened, but on whose side you are. Our search for the truth can then become less important than our allegiance to a cause, an ideology, for example, or a political party, or a tribal or religious identity, or a pro-government or opposition outlook. And so, publics all over the world can begin to fragment and societies can drift into deadlock. In such a world, it is absolutely critical more than ever that the public should have somewhere to turn for reliable, balanced, objective and accurate information as best as it can be discovered. No one, including the Nation Media Group, will ever be able to do that perfectly. But it is crit critically important that all of us should try.
Yadi Mavith, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Friday Night Reflections. Bienvenue tout le monde. Ça me fait grand plaisir d'être parmi vous encore ce soir pour les réflexions de vendredi soir. I'm Nahi Denshi, mayor of Calgary. I've just celebrated my 10th year as mayor, but much more important than that, I'm celebrating my second appearance on Friday Night Reflections. And after the last one, yeah, I'm surprised they invited me back. But here we are. I'm coming to you from my fully equipped home studio here in Calgary on the land of the Treaty 7 peoples, Nitsitapi, the people. We call them the people of the Blackfoot Confederacy now, as well as the mountain people, the Ahe Nakoda, the stony people, the beaver people, whom we call the Sutina people. And we honor today the Métis people with their deep connection to this land. So I'm here in my fully equipped home studio, which is also called my dining room. Because, of course, no Smiley family in my generation actually eats in the dining room, so I may as well use it for something. And as long as I don't knock over that vase, I think we're going to be okay. Grab your chai, grab your nasta, and let's talk about this week's Friday Night Reflections. Before we get into the topic for this week, I do want to talk a little bit about the coronavirus and about the COVID-19 epidemic. It's been nine months that we have been living this very different life. For many of us, it's been a time of isolation. For many of us, it's been a time of fear. I know for some of us, including me and my family, the reopening of Jamaat Khanna was a remarkable blessing uh, for those times that we were able to go. But ultimately, we're living a very different kind of life. And it's okay to feel bad about it. It's okay to mourn the things that we've lost. It's okay to feel sad. That's just human. But what we also have to remember is that we've got more work to do together. We're not there yet. And even while the recent uh, announcement that a vaccine may be close means we can see the other end of the river from the bridge, we got to stay on the bridge. It does us no good if we fall into the water. And so I know that people across Canada are facing different government policies and different restrictions, but I need to say something for all of us which is that when we have a different kind of natural disaster, when we have a flood or a fire, there's nothing we can do. No single one of us can control the rain or the fire. But in a pandemic, the spread of the pandemic is in our own hands. It's in our own clean hands. So I need to remind everyone that discipline is the best vaccine. And we need to continue to be disciplined. That means wash your hands, cover your cough, do all the good hygiene. It means keep your physical distance, six feet or two meters, or if you're in Calgary, 36 mini donuts between you and people, particularly those you don't know. It means wear a mask. Wear a mask anytime you're in public, anytime you're going to be within that six feet or two meters of others. And I'm going to add two more things. The next one is get your flu shot. The flu has nothing to do with COVID, but if you get your flu shot, it means you're less likely to get the influenza and you're less likely to need medical care and overwhelm the health system in its busiest time of the year. And the other is it's time to collapse your bubble. It's time to think hard on every single decision that you make. Is this the right thing to do? Do I have to do this now? Here in Alberta, the premier has been very clear if that person doesn't live in your home, they shouldn't be in your home. We need to keep our cohort small. We need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to avoid risky behavior so that those who need to go to work, those who are providing essential services, who can't work from home, have the ability to do that. We need to be able to work hard so that in the areas where the schools are open, we can keep the schools open for our students. So for many months, I've been saying the same thing and I'm just gonna say it again. It's about clean hands. It's about good hygiene. It's about clear heads. It's about thinking about every single decision that we make with a COVID lens. And it's about open hearts. It's about kindness and compassion and looking after one another every single day. Because we'll get through this the way we get through everything here on this land. We'll get through this together. I am very excited about tonight's theme. Tonight's theme is fact and fiction, the role of media in democracy. 
Now, one of the reasons I'm excited about this is because I get to moderate a panel of journalists and also Zane. We'll get to that. Usually I'm on the other end of the questions. Usually I'm the one being asked the tough questions. So let's see how I do the other way around. This is a really important issue for all of us to think about in our communities right now. Certainly many of us have been glued to the screen uh, in terms of the United States election. Is Arizona called? Is Arizona not called? Where is this going to go? What happens after the election? What happens when someone doesn't concede? But there's something much deeper than that in terms of the conversation that we're having together as a community. How is it that media institutions that have come together to tell our stories, to help us move forward as a community are now being derided as fake news, people don't trust them, people look to social media or people live in a post-fact world uh, to determine their opinions? And how does that happen? And what is the role of our community in making sure that we're strengthening our democracy? What is the role of media in making sure that we're strengthening our democracy? So the main stage today, we have an incredible panel. And I know you, like me, feel an enormous sense of pride when we see people like our next guests on television talking about important issues, when we see people that look like us, that belong to the Ismaili community out there representing us. It makes us all feel very proud. And I am so proud of the panel that we have brought together today. Two of the most esteemed journalists in North America, and also Zane. So tonight we get to hear from Ali Velshi. You know Ali Velshi is a Canadian based in New York City. He has worked at CNN. He had his own show on Al Jazeera America. He started as a business reporter. And of course, since 2016, he's been one of the main anchors on MSNBC. And you'll have seen a lot of him lately. And he's got some harrowing stories about what it means to be a journalist in a time of fake news. We also have with us Farah Nasser. For those of you in Toronto, you know that Farah is one of the most trusted voices uh, in local news in Toronto, is the anchor of Global News at 5.30 and 6. She's covered elections at every level. She moderated, this strikes me with fear, she moderated the only mayoral debate uh, in the Toronto mayoral election in 2018. She's covered the Toronto Van Attack, the G20 Summit, the Toronto 18 Terror Trials. She's a back-to-back -back winner of the RTNDA Sam Ross Award. And her reporting in particular on issues of diversity, inclusion, and racism has been extraordinary. So I'm so excited to have Ali and Farah with us today. We also have today, inexplicably, Zane Velji. We don't know why he's here. He's hosted Friday Night Reflections before, he's just kind of showed up. Uh, he's not a journalist, but you do see him on TV all the time. In all seriousness, Zane is an extraordinary community leader here in Calgary. I'm proud to call him a very good friend. Our friendship obviously is entirely based on making bad jokes about one another. Uh, he was a member of the top 40 under 40. Professionally, he's a partner at a strategy and marketing firm called Northweather that does extraordinary work for charities, nonprofits, causes, and advocacy. And if you're a podcast fan, you'll know that Zane is the host of one of the highest rated podcasts uh, in Canada, The Strategists, as well as its spinoff where Canadians get to talk to Americans about their lives called You, The People. And just this year, he was named the University of Alberta with the University of Alberta's Alumni Horizon Award. So with that, let's go to the panel. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, two of North America's most prominent journalists in local, national, and international news, and also Zane, who I understand owns a television. So I don't want this whole conversation to be about the United States election, but anyone who was watching television on election night and flipping between channels would have seen all three of you. And I thought that it might be fun to start with a little anecdote from there. And plus, I've got Ali Velshi here, so I have to ask him the question that everyone in North America wants the answer to. So we're going to start there, Ali. Did your colleague Steve Kornacki ever get to sleep? Um, I, I made four attempts over over five days to get him to leave. I, I was marginally successful a couple of times. Uh, I got in, got him to leave. He didn't seem convinced that he was leaving. I think I stayed on TV for two or two and a half hours, and he just came back, and he looked exactly the same. As you know, he wore the same clothes uh, for several days. He's just retired his tie. 
uh, now, and it's it's all ripped up and damaged. But um, he he slept, I think, four hours or five hours over five days. Wow. And I thought the rest of us were staying up late. Why don't I go to yeah. each of you, and we'll start with you, Oli. Just give us your favorite anecdote from that long, long election night, uh, and tell us a good story. Go ahead, Oli. You're kidding me, right? There are no favorite anecdotes. Uh, this is <laughs> this is an extension of a, of a long nightmare for us. Uh, it, it, you know, I started, one thing I did, I, I, I relieve when I can, Steve Kornacki at the, at the big board. Um, there are only a few of us who are trained on it, but I actually wanted to be out there. I've spent most of the last few months uh, in different places in America, mostly in swing states, and I, I, I ended it up in Philadelphia. And we planned this months ago. Uh, where would I finally be? Where, what, where would I be on the last weekend of the election? Where would I be on election night? And I was in the streets of Philadelphia. And whatever ends up happening with this and, and however it goes, uh, and, and there are lots of issues to discuss about misinformation and, and, and the anger, uh, the visceral anger in America, 150 million people almost voted. Uh, so, yeah. you know, at least you're starting with the idea that people had enough uh, civic responsibility to go to the ballots and vote. Uh, whether they were doing it on bad information is a secondary issue and we need to deal with that. But being in Philadelphia and watching the record setting voting through the course of the day, for a lot of people who told me it was their first election uh, and they were much older than voting age, um, they were out there, they felt they had a role in the future of America. And regarding, you know, regardless of the outcome of the election, it was great to actually see that level of participation. Typically in America, we see about 55%. We probably hit about 65% this time. That's amazing. Fire, what about you? Covering it in a very different way from a Canadian perspective. What was your favorite part of the night or your most interesting anecdote? Yeah, I mean, unlike uh, Ali, the, the, this is my first U.S. election covering it from Washington, D.C. So uh, it, was, it was unforgettable. It was incredible. But I think the thing that I'm going to remember the most is actually not election night. It is Saturday morning when the result uh, was called. And it's because I got to DC about a week earlier and it was so sleepy and you could just really feel the anxiety and people were just anxious. And there was this uncertainty. And then it's like the entire capital of the United States changed in, in, in an hour. It was like a different place. There was so much energy. Uh, there was really this feeling like everybody was just kind of breathing this like sigh of relief and just exhaling for the first time in a long time. And people were popping champagne. They were dancing in the streets. They were singing. Um, and just seeing that shift is, is something I'm never going to forget. It was it was unbelievable. Amazing. Now, I was busy in a city council meeting all evening. And so I was relying on massively refreshing uh, your websites and occasional texts from Zane, uh, who was busy doing commentary that night as well. And when I finally got home, I heard Zane say one of the most thoughtful things I've heard any commentator say uh, that evening about the nature of the referendum that we were witnessing. So Zane, tell us your favorite anecdote and give us the line about the referendum. Well, well, thank you, Nahid. And I just want to clarify uh, for, for uh, Jamathi members listening at home, uh, I have two TVs, not just one TV. So uh, I, I'm doing okay. And in fact, one of those TVs is even even a color TV. Okay, so here, here let me, you know, for, for the election night for me, it was this moment where I kind of realized that this was not just an election where folks were having a referendum on Donald Trump. They were having a referendum on each other. Because, you know, the first time they elected Donald Trump, you wanted to shake up the system, you wanted to a different sort of voltage in Washington, that's fine. But for the second time, you've got six years of a track record and four years of a presidency to know exactly who this guy is, to know, you know, exactly what he stands for, how he conducts himself, how he thinks about big and small issues, how he thinks about other people. So I think that's going to be the real reconciliation point that that's going to extend well beyond the Joe Biden presidency, perhaps, which is, you know, to that point, now, that referendum on each other that this election was also about. And that's really where I want to take a little jump, if I may. You know, we've got with us some incredibly accomplished people. And I know as an Ismaili community, we're also very proud of you. And we feel a little bit of pride uh, when we see you on the air telling these important stories. But we live in a strange media world. So I just celebrated my 10th anniversary as the mayor of Calgary, believe it or not. And when I started in, those, in the first year, I had a full press gallery. They sit in windows, uh, in little offices with windows that overlook the council chamber. As of this election, the entire City Hall Press Gallery in Canada's third largest city 
was down to three full-time reporters, all of whom had to cover other things from time to time. We're up to four now. Thank you, Global. We've added a City Hall reporter. But, um, but you know, we've gone from 10 or 12 or 15 people who covered City Hall every single day to three people. And, and they're great reporters, but their job is just stenographer. You know, all they can do is say, and council voted on this and council voted on that. They don't have the time or the ability to get deep into the stories. So I'm wondering, and I'd love your perspective, and we'll start with Fire about this. Have the changes and the cutbacks in media and how we think about media led to, in some way, the situation that Zane is talking about of an oversimplified, overly divided community that doesn't see nuance in the conversations that we're trying to have. So Farah, your thoughts? I, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think this, the idea of news deserts is real. There are areas now in this country that don't have coverage, that don't have any news coverage at all. So that, first of all, is problematic. We know what an important facet of democracy media is. I mean, and Walter Crockett said it is democracy. So that in itself is really important. We've also at the same time noticed, Nahid, maybe you're answering questions at your press conference, but you know, here in Ontario, uh, you're on a phone line trying to get information from a politician and you're waiting on hold for several hours before you can even get an answer. And then you're not even really, it's not the same being in person to kind of hold people accountable and ha and, and get that response. So I think that in itself uh, is a really different way of covering the news, right, than we're used to. Um, so I think that that is one way that, that I think things have changed. We're doing a lot more with a lot less. News is lean um, and, and there isn't the money that there was in it before. So that's why you're not seeing in the third largest, the third largest city. It's not just COVID. It's just how things have have changed, and that that's a real shift in how we've we've seen the media previously. Now in the states, of course, it's a different story because it is so polarized. I was there, and. Uh, for the first time, uh, Ali, I spent, you'll be interested in this, I spent, you know, however many days, all I was doing, because I couldn't go out and, and do too many reports, I did a few, but I, I just sat there and I just flipped between Fox, between CNN, between Ali and MSNBC, and it, it just... It felt like there was two different worlds. It felt like this was a country, but there was two countries in this one country. Right. And I think that's what's led to a lot of this. I think that the news also should bear some responsibility for, for the, the way things are right now. It really is a chicken and an egg situation. Where did it start and where do we go from here? Ali, you've spoken a lot about this. I encourage people yeah. to seek out your 2017 TEDx talk. But give us, a, give us a synopsis of your thoughts on the media and its role in this divided well, I think there are two issues. One is, you know, the tagline on the Washington Post says democracy dies in darkness. And what you described at Calgary City Council is it getting darker. The lights are, are, are getting, uh, they're not as bright on you. And that's when things can start to go wrong. Uh, we have in the United States this problem uh, in multiples. We have a lot of local, not just news deserts, we have places where people think they've got lo local news because there's still a local newspaper or a local newscast, but it's not from their city. It's not, it's not from their town. It's all aggregated information from these news conglomerates. Um, so when I said that we had a 55% average turnout for presidential elections, that's presidential elections. Uh, if there are only state elections or, or uh, House of Representative elections, the turnout is lower. If it's local elections, the turnout is yet lower. And yet that's where everything matters. So what we've done is we've, we've you know, it used to be that people would be in, in local government and then they would, would go to other parts of government. But they had the experience of dealing with people who needed their crime dealt with and their ambulances and their garbage and stuff like that. And you would have robust policy discussions around that or education. Well, now we don't have robust policy discussions around policy issues. If you followed American media for the last four years, it is very high level um, stuff that doesn't necessarily affect individuals. And then suddenly you have something like George Floyd or the, the police brutality issues that we face in the last six months. And that becomes very real to people. Then it's about policing and then it's about local stuff. But you realize, as we did with Ferguson, Missouri, six years ago, that Two thirds of the population of Ferguson was African American, but there was only one member of the five member city council and only one African American police officer because people don't pay attention to what's going on locally. And part of that is because we don't cover what's going on locally. So unless you're kind of nerdy and into local politics, you don't, you don't follow that stuff. And you're in the third largest city in Canada. So imagine what happens in littler towns, uh, which, which America is made of. So I think there are two issues. We don't have the commitment to news on that level. We don't have a commitment to policy discussion 
discussions on that level. And then the things that Farah talks about in that this is not the world's most lucrative thing for a lot of people to get into. So, you know, it just becomes easier to sit at your desk. And so many journalists now are just desk jockeys, right? They've got a computer, they sit where they are, and they churn out stories, much of which is opinion or, or based on some phone calls. It, it, it does, it is the dimming of the lights on democracy. And I think we have to take it very seriously. Oh, I, I think it's absolutely clear that the erosion of local is turning people to more national and, and international tribes, right? So, you know, when we see, and I, you and I have experienced this, right, in the political trenches, when we don't have local journalists covering the day-to-day -day beat, what ends up happening in many cases is that opinion starts driving narrative. Opinion pieces literally drove narratives, and, and, and that's fine. Now, there's nothing wrong with opinion pieces, but the fact is that when you don't have journalists kind of covering the day-to-day -day beat of what's going on, you can have certain narratives that start taking fold. Then you start compounding that when, when people don't have a no, local news node to access, they try to find their tribe somewhere else. They try to find it through social. They try to find it right. online. And they try to find that tribe that is not necessarily about seeking new information. It's about satiating the worldview that they already have. And this is where we get into the complicated you know, factors of social media, which in 2008 was really nice and rosy to kind of you know, put out your information and have conversations with. Well, let's be clear, in the 2020 environment, it's behavioral modification. And, and that's what we're ultimately finding is that people start getting into narrower and narrower silos which increase the fractures more and more that present themselves. So the ripple effects or the butterfly effects of not having local, which then gets driven by narrative, which then tries to get you to find more of that particular narrative online and then find a tribe, is the path we've seen millions upon millions of people go down, which is potentially one of the you know, hypotheses of the, of the political fracturing we've seen on both sides of our collective borders. So Farah, you're, you've come from local. Uh, you are one of the most trusted faces of local news uh, in your city in Toronto. Talk about that. Talk about local and telling the stories that matter to us on the ground in our communities. Well, you know, even to the extent when we're talking about, you know, a, a fractured country or we're talking about divisions, I mean, I've I've pushed the boundaries in some ways talking about race, you know, and, and bringing stories that aren't told on the local news on the local news. And it hasn't been easy because there are a lot of people who, um, to me, I, I feel like I'm holding a mirror up to what's happening in society, but there are people who don't want to hear what the truth is, right? So that can be very difficult as well. So we're talking, you know, we're talking about COVID, for example, and how racialized communities are more impacted by COVID. Well, there's people who don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that, um, you know, healthcare is different for somebody that doesn't look like you, or that, you know, th there's um, discrimination in hockey, for example. I remember I did a story on that, and the amount of of hate mail I got after that was I, I was not expecting that type of flood. So I think that you know there still is um, this really polarized view where people think that you're you're still in a way fake news or you're still biased in your reporting um, when really you're just showing people what's out there that may maybe it wasn't shown before um, so it's difficult I mean I'll get an email I'll get three messages in, in, in the day on the same story one will say um, you know you're left you're, you're a left-wing hack and one will say your right wing is showing and one will call me fake news so, it, it, and it's not just me. I mean, this happens to everybody. I can't even imagine what Ellie goes through. Um, so it, it's it's a very challenging time to do this job, especially when uh, a certain someone has made a journalist, you know, public enemy number one. I want to come back to the issue of fake news. And I don't really mean fake news, but I mean the branding of fake news. But I don't want to leave this issue of racism. Um, and, you know, as people of color who've aspired to the top of your positions, who are there on our televisions, I think you have a unique perspective on this. But in the midst of the George Floyd stuff in, in the summer, uh, in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement, I had two fascinating conversations. They were each over an hour and a half long with the publisher of the local newspaper and with the managing editor of one of the local news stations. And the conversations were about casual racism or institutional racism, if you prefer, in how we tell our stories. So for Remembrance Day, for example, uh, on the CBC, there was a story about a, a US war veteran who was doing a nice thing, cycling to all the war monuments in Calgary on Remembrance Day. And in the very first line, they said, a proud Sikh, and a soldier. And I thought to myself, well, his name is Singh and he wears a turban. People can probably connect the dots. What does his being a Sikh have to do with it? And it was just one example of the kinds of deconstructionist narratives, if I can sound all academic for a moment, that we have to think about in terms of how we tell stories. 
And Fire, the, you, you've really been a trailblazer in this uh, in so many ways, helping people see, especially in a city as diverse as Toronto, their country in a new way. But what does that work like institutionally? Does the media understand that we've been telling stories of the powerful and we need to get off of the sort of the National Geographic 1950s special when we tell stories of people who don't look the same? Look, I will be honest, I think it took for all of this to happening to happen, this racial reckoning to take place for things to change. I mean, uh, I politely laughed at comments made five years ago that I would never laugh at now, that I would call people out, that I would have the courage to call people out on now. Um, and I think that says a lot. And But we have to remember that though you're watching television and you're seeing bylines that have names that are, you know, ethnic, that you're comfortable with, most of the people that are still running everything don't come from there. It's going to take time, though. I think things are changing. I'm very um, optimistic about the future. I mean, even when we started out, like Ali was the only one I could go to 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 ask advice. There was nobody who looked like me on camera. I remember he was working on on a business show, a business channel then, and it wasn't even I didn't want to want to do business. So, but it was it was it was the only one. And now, when we look at the amount of his smileys that are out there, that are it, it is it gives me goosebumps just talking about it. So. I think that we are moving in the right direction. I think things are changing, but certainly, certainly discrimination has existed in our industry. I'm sure many places it certainly does, but but it took for this to make change and there will be change. Oh, I wanna go so deep on this question. I wanna talk about accents and I wanna talk about the voices that we that we value and that we don't value, but I will at this point disclose a secret, which is that uh, Farah mentioned all of these smileys who are working in media now, and there are a lot of them now. So on the night of the Canadian election, uh, Zane, of course, being Zane, started a little text group of all of these smileys who were on TV that night. Of course, it's called the Fire Nasser Fan Club, just saying. Um, but tonight, Ali, as you answer the question about racism within the media, I'm also yeah. putting you on the spot. I, I would love that. Will yeah. you join the Fire Nasser Fan Club? So I, I, it makes, I mean, every time I talk to Fire or see her or, or exchange a message with her, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that story because I remember it when I was starting out and it was, it was yet harder. Um, but I think representation is the answer on all of these fronts because we're talking about racism now. But um, casual homophobia, casual making jokes about people's weight, the Me Too movement indicated to people that, oh, you know these jokes you've been making or those comments you've been passing on how someone's dressed? Also not appropriate. So we all just have to have this open mind and say, there's so much out there we don't know. And we don't know because we didn't invite the people to the table to have the conversation. So now in newsrooms, if you have the representation, you just learn things you didn't know before. You learn what you don't say and what's inappropriate to people. I have said, I remember saying something about transgender, transgenders, I think I said on TV. And I got all these things. They don't call people transgenders. You call them transgendered people or transgender people. It's like, okay, great. Now I know it. Now I will do it right. But the things that I have said in my past that I didn't know were even wrong because there was no one there to tell me that it was wrong. Uh, now that all changes. And it, the, the decision you have to make now as journalists, as the consuming public, is what side of that do you want to be on? Do you want to sit there and say, huh, that's interesting. I didn't know how that worked. Thanks for telling me. Or let's discuss it. Or do you want to say, don't change my, my, my worldview. Don't change my reality because that's not how I learned it. So it can't be true. So Zane, how do we get those stories into the media so the media feels more authentic to all of us? Yeah, and I mean, I think it starts, Nahed, with this conversation that, you know, and I think Ali and Far are excellent examples of this, that people that look like us aren't just there to cover stories about people who just look like us. And I think that's right. one of the biggest mistakes that, that I've kind of seen is just an assumption. You know, I, when, when, we, when our prime minister during the last federal election had a scandal, uh, the blackface, brownface scandal that, that was going on, I had 24 media appearances over the next two days, and I wasn't the only racialized or brown or black person that had those appearances. If you just walked by the hallway at the CBC or at the CTV and you just looked up, there's probably a black or brown person commenting on what happened. And then guess what happened, Nahed? Two days later, the story went away, and all those people who provided excellent commentary just because they had a brown or black face were nowhere to be seen. 
They were excellent at, at providing commentary on so many things. They were educated professors. They had lived experience. They had, you know, so much texture and depth. But guess what? They were only brought in to comment because guess what? The face of that guy matched the face of you. And I, and I think, you know, there, there, there is a real sort of opportunity here to, to do that. Per Farah's point of saying, how do we get more and more people, not just at the table, but cr controlling the decisions of the agenda gets that, that gets put on that table. Thank you so much uh, for that. I want to make sure that we get into another conversation here. Uh, and that really is that when you think back and you think of Walter Cronkite, as Farah has alluded to, or Lloyd Robertson, or Peter Mansbridge. Notice these are all white men I'm talking about. But my point is that these were, okay, Barbara Walters, we'll throw a white woman in there. These are trusted voices, right? These are the voices that people turn to when they needed to know the truth. And now we live in a world where, frankly, I am scared for Farah and Ali when they're out on the street covering something because I don't know what people are going to say. They're going to talk about the fake news. First of all, I'd like a personal perspective on how does that make you feel as a journalist, as someone who's engaged in this work, whose passion is to tell these stories. But second of all, how did we get here and how do we restore trust in our institutions, but particularly in the media, because I, for one, believe you can't have a healthy democracy without trust and faith in media. So far, I'll go to you first. You know, I, I wrote a lot of notes on this because I think I think we all have a role to play here. So uh, for government, I think it's supporting media. So as we've seen, we talked about this news deserts concept, the idea that, you know, some of these media organizations, they need some help in certain areas. As you mentioned, I mean, it's, it's a part of a healthy democracy. It benefits all of us. So that's a big thing. Citizens, get perspective learn from other people, watch watch perspectives that are not your own. I mean, I spend most of my time in the United States actually watching Fox News to try to understand how people feel, a perspective that we don't normally get in Canada. And also, we need to educate our kids. Media literacy is so important. We need to teach our kids what fake news is, what misinformation is. And as journalists, we need to do a better idea, and this is for the next generation, but also for our viewers, to really teach them what the difference is between a pundit, between a journalist, between a commentator, because these are key differences. When you're watching the news and you're watching CNN late at night or you're watching it during the day, it's very different. Um, and I think people don't really understand that. I think that's been lost on a lot of people, just like when you're flipping the newspaper and you see the editorial. I don't know if the general public and especially our, our, young, uh, our youngsters, if they really understand what the difference is. And I think it is so important to point that out. Um, and I think it's also news organizations, we have to go back to our core values. I mean, our, our core values, this, this idea of, you know, transparency, integrity, these, these best practices that we, we grew up with. Because I think in some cases we've gone away from that. And so I think there's really, again, a, a role to play for everybody. Um, and there's a lot of work to do. Ali, I've read everywhere that you do fake news. Tell me about fake news. Well, it became a real problem because uh, in May, you know, I was in, in Minneapolis covering uh, the George Floyd protests. And at one point I was, I was you know, I got gassed, masked, I got gassed a few times. I, I actually travel now with a, a kit that has a, a bulletproof vest, uh, a mask and a helmet, which I've never used in the United States before. I used to use that when I traveled wow. overseas. I now have that for the United States. We got, got gassed a few times, and then at one point the police broke into a crowd that was marching. It was a completely peaceful march. I had been covering it for a few hours, and the they gassed everybody. And we had masks, so most of the people left, and we were now at the front of the line, and I got shot by a rubber bullet. Now, I don't know what happened that night. I'm not really clear on it, uh, and one day we'll have time to have a proper investigation. We were very clearly media, and we got shot. Then we retreated and we came to another intersection where there were no people anymore because all the civilians had left because they were gas masking everybody, gassing everybody. So we were walking now trying to get out and we actually put our hands up and said, we're media. And the police said, we don't care. And they fired again. Nobody got hit that time because they're just bad shots. So, you know, far as talking about government support, um, I'd take I'd take not government antagonism at this point. Uh, it's unsafe now. I mean, I've done nothing but travel for the last three or four months. And we have travel security. Uh, we get threats. Uh, this is, as far as I said, when she met me, I was a business reporter, man. I did the stock market. What's with the threats? Where did, nobody signed up for this stuff. We tell our stories, but when people say, 
exclude. And, and there's lots of valid criticism of why we are not trusted by people and why people don't see their stories reflected. But when you go down that line and you suggest that our job is to bear witness, to tell you things are happening, and then to hold power to account. And when the government interferes in your ability to do that, and when leaders start doing that, that's when it starts to break down because there are a whole lot of people looking for answers and looking to, for people to blame. And when you make that the media, and I don't care whether it's my media or somebody else's media, uh, there were a number of, of uh, reporters from other outlets, uh, most of whom report on me critically, who were arrested during protests. And I was out there, uh, you know, trying to defend their First Amendment rights. You don't shut the media down. And you argue in the arena of, of discussion, of ideas, right? Like you do, Nahid. That's what we should be doing. If there's an argument to be had about why we are covering things the way they are, we should have that discussion openly. But things have taken a dark turn, and it is worrisome, because there are a lot of my colleagues I know who say, I didn't sign up for this, and I'm not looking for this. You know, thank you for sharing that story, Ellie. Um, I, it's a shocking one, and I'm, I'm happy that you were willing and courageous enough to tell us about that one thing that happened to you that is emblematic of so many other things. It happened to a lot of my colleagues too. I mean, there were, in that week alone, there were 300 instances of police violence against reporters. So I, I got off easy. Well, you got shot. I don't know that that's that easy. But you know, I think that, Zane, I, I want you to touch on one thing because then I want to go to a little news you can use in terms of what we need to do to strengthen our media and our democratic institutions. But Zane, I'm gonna ask you a very basic question, which is what's the role of media in strengthening our institutions and particularly in strengthening our democracy? Yeah, and I think it's vital. I mean, it, it, it is one of the recipes in this cocktail of civil society, right? This ability to have a, a press that is free, that's able to voice uh, the truth, that it does not have to be beholden to what I call the two sidesisms, right? One of the biggest things we have seen that I, at least in my uh, observations of the last four years, is pushing the press to do two sides, right? It's not about covering both sides, it's having and giving the press the runway and the freedom to say, no, this is what's happening, right? You know, the old adage, what, what was it? You know, if it's, uh, if it's raining outside, it's not about asking some person to say, if, is it raining or is it not raining? It's about going out and saying, is it raining or not yourself? And I think right now, certain political groups, certain advocacy groups, frankly, social media has pushed this two sidesism uh, well, into, into media outlets and journalistic uh, organizations. And I think what we need, and this is not really a fault of their own, is to give these or institutions a runway to say, go report the facts. As long as it's true, the wind and the people and the safeguards and the rail guards we built into our system are behind you to do that. So I think that's the, the main main source because, you know, to Ali's point, and which is also like that Washington Post um, tagline that democracy dies in darkness, really, if we have a press that is just there to report on both sides and let you make up your mind, so to speak, as, as has been the, frankly, as has been the MO for various news organizations, then outright, we are, we are failing the, the civil society and the healthy discourse and the outright reporting of facts that we need to sustain a strong and robust civil society. The, the problem is, I feel like this other side is, I, I get that, that you can't report when, when there's horrible things happening. You can't report two sides. There aren't two sides. There's right and wrong in a way, right? There's, there's, there's one side when we're talking about race, you know, uh, inequality. But when I'm watching, you know, correspondents or people like almost ridiculing, like ridiculing the other side, I don't know what purpose that serves. I think if it's based on facts and evidence, that's one thing. But we are so divided right now. There needs to be a way to tell the stories that, that bring people together. Those beautiful moments where you hear that, you know, somebody who's, you know, a, a gun advocate is hugging somebody who's from Black Lives Matter. There there has to be ways to tell those stories and bring people together. Um, because, again, and when I was watching cable news, it, it was it was making fun of that other side. When Hillary Clinton called called a, a bunch of blue collar workers deplorables and then lost the election, there was a reason you, you alienate people. And that's that's not what we need right now. Ali, you've got a very unique perspective on this, given the variety of different media outlets you've worked in. And you find yeah. yourself now, of course, at MSNBC, which has a particular uh, point of view, shall we say, or worldview. How do we reconcile these things? How do we reconcile the need to be fair and just in our reporting and our storytelling with the need to really call out bad things yeah. when they happen. So I think there's a bit of each of Farah and Zane's views on this that I, that I think have to combine to, to make sense. To, to Zane's point, um, we, need, we need freedom to, 
to tell the stories as they are. And that comes from resources. The only way you bear witness is if you can actually fly someone to the border and look at those cages and tell you what's actually going on and interview people and follow their stories and do all that kind of stuff. And if you're just doing stuff from your desk and your computer, that's not going to get told. Um, on the other side, uh, Farah makes the point that do we signpost for people what's commentary and what's opinion and what's news coverage? And I think we, and you know, Nyad, from my uh, fake news speech, uh, my, my TEDx talk, that I, I feel that we've failed people for, for decades on that front. We don't signpost it, so people don't hear it. So I've spent the last two, three months out on the street talking to people, and I ask them, I go to different cities across America to ask people about their own personal experiences. What do I get? Bumper sticker, political stuff. I'm hearing from somebody on the streets of Kenosha, not about what happened in Kenosha last week that, that upset them, but I'm hearing something that Donald Trump said about it. I'm at the border, at the border wall in Arizona talking to locals, and I'm hearing politicized polemic. And that's what the problem is, that, that the combination of not having local news, the idea that people don't form their own opinions on what happens around them, but they fall into these support groups on social media and in cable news, all contributes to the idea that if I take the runway that Zane says I deserve, which I will take every night, I take it and I lose half the viewers who don't want to share that, who want their warm milk. They will go somewhere else and they do go somewhere else. And I, I struggle with that. I wonder about that a lot. I'm 30 years into this career and I, I wonder how we fix it and I, and I worry about what I've done to spoil it. You know, folks, I'm going to reveal a Friday Night Reflections production secret right now, which is we are filming this in a tight window of time when Zara has just, or Farah, excuse me, has just come off the air and when Ali is about to go on the air. Uh, so we don't have a ton of time, though. I think this could go on all night. This is amazing. My heart is racing with the intellectual things that are happening uh, in this panel right now. But let's end on some news you can use, if you like, which is I'm going to ask each of you in turn, starting with Farah, what do we as citizens do? How can we as citizens build our communities and our democracy? And how can the media play a role in that? But what can we do to support that kind of media that is community building? We'll start with Farah. I think with citizenry, it, it's, it's, it comes down to listening to the other perspective. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's not what you're going to want to hear. You're going to want to yell at the TV, but you need to know that this is how people feel. Why do they feel isolated? Why do they not want to wear masks because of COVID? Maybe they're worried about their business. Maybe they don't want to think it exists because they're losing money and they're bankrupt. Like there is, there's always other reasons why people feel the way that they, they do. And I think it's important for all of us to really have empathy and understand. We are not going to agree with it, but it's important to understand where things come from. So that's one area. And I think, I mean, I'm a mom, I have two little kids. I, I, I think it is so crucial that we really educate this next generation. I'm very passionate about this idea of media literacy and explaining to them how things work. And as you're watching, I mean, point that out, point that out to your, your teenage kids about, about who this person's giving their opinion. This is facts. What, what the difference is between those two. I've already te started teaching my seven-year-old about the difference between fact and opinion. Um, so I think those are two things we can do. And then as a media or as media organizations, again, we need to go back to these core values. The Nation Media Group, uh, which we all know is uh, very close to our hearts. I mean, I'm just going to, one of their core values is news, va news should not appease augment or respond to political commercial interests and journalists should really test that so what factor why is this story important why does it matter to me why am i telling it so what and i think as journalists and as media organizations we need to do better at that uh, i'd start with sitting down with your your family perhaps even your friends and auditing the media diet that you have you know, at the end of the day, you are the media that you consume. And so I think it'd be a fascinating exploration as an extension to Farah's point, sitting down with your family and saying, what are we each consuming? You will be surprised where some of the folks in your family, where, where even your partner or your significant other might be getting their news from. It might be certain Twitter accounts you've never heard of, certain media outlets you have, you have maybe not considered. So audit that and then try to, you know, figure out verified sources. And then the second thing I'd say is around social media. You know, we've discussed it a bit, but social media has really become a rage machine for many folks. Is it still a great distribution mechanism for news? Absolutely. But what we have to realize is that if you're not paying for it, you are the product. 
And what these platforms have figured out is that by putting anger and rage into the zeitgeist, into of micro cuts of fake news, that, that, which by the way, is not easy to discern. That's one of the things we should talk about is that fake news online is really, really hard to discern, but go with verified sources and understand that everything on social media that you see, especially with products that you're not paying for, you are being commoditized on and, and, to, uh, and to recognize that. Ali Velshi, last word to you, but as, as I ask you that, I know that the audience will abandon us and go for their warm milk if I don't ask you from your vantage point, what's going to happen in the United States? How are we going to get out of this crazy situation we're in? So talk to us about what citizens can do and give well, us your opinion on that. On that. Uh, December 13th, the Electoral College is going to vote for the next president of the United States. And uh, with some luck, all of this stuff that's going on right now will be over by then. Um, so, so I'm very worried about what this portends for American democracy. But to the to the point about how to news you can use, think about your cell phone, right? The the way the cell phone figures out where you are uh, and which tar which tower to use is it's it's always got to have three towers. It triangulates where you are. If you have three points in space, you always know where you are. So triangulate your information the same way. When you see something, make sure you can find it somewhere else. So the guy who went to that suburban DC pizza parlor because he thought that uh, Hillary Clinton was running a pedophilia ring in it. He went with a gun and he actually thought he was going to save little children. He thought he was doing something good because he had bad information. Now, just make sure before you, and that's an extreme example because generally people don't respond to the news by taking a gun and going to do something, but we all respond to the news somehow in our conversations or in our voting. So try and find the information somewhere else, even if it's from a different perspective. If you at least understand that two different people are reporting on this from two different organizations, from two different perspectives, at least the story, the underlying story might be true. I don't know that social media is compatible with democracy. I really worry about uh, whether in the end it has really removed us uh, from reality. I remember when the internet started, because uh, I was just starting as a reporter at the time, and when you know when it became popularized and cell phones were started and we would get uh, browsers on our computers at work, I remember thinking, no one will ever be able to lie again. This is the best thing that ever happened. Social media came out, if you tell a lie, they're all gonna tell, they're all gonna call you out for it and that's it. I had no idea. I was so naive. I had no idea that you'd be able to lie better and louder and faster and, and, and more effectively than you ever could before. So I think we all have to, we can't fix society, we can fix our own consumption habits. Just like your cell phone, triangulate your information and at least know that what you're consuming is true, then formulate an opinion on it. Thanks so much, Ellie. I said that would be the last word, but man, that was amazing. So I do want to give Fire and Zane one last chance for any final words. First to you, Zane. No, I'm good. Thank you for this for this excellent conversation. You know, I think we we find an, an, a very interesting space we're in right now. And I think, you know, it's it's with the leadership of folks like Farah and Ali who are not just pushing the stories that matter, but pushing the editorial decisions that matter to get us the stories, to unearth those stories uh, that makes our democracy and civil society richer. So thank you for the incredible conversation. I just want to kind of go over the point about social media, because I think that's where a lot of people get their news. And I think what, what Zane said is so correct. I mean, if you're not paying for news, you're the product. And, yep. you know, we are, we, we're in this place where we just need like this, you know, uh, as Ram calls it, ne Nescafe journalism, right? We just need this hit. We just need to know what's going on. But, but really dig deeper. And if anybody watching is part of a social media company, take some responsibility. I mean, figure out these algorithms to kind of widen the perspective. Because again, these are echo chambers. You are following people from Jamaat Ghana, people that are your friends, and you're getting one perspective. It's not the perspective of everybody. And keep that in mind as you're reading this. Have that, have that knowledge as you're, as you're going through social media. Thank you so much. You know, people often think that politicians and the media are at odds. And certainly uh, we've seen a lot of that with politicians right. of all stripes recently. But I want to say something that I don't often get to say as a politician, which is I want to say to you all, thank you. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you for shining a light in a very dark and cold world sometimes uh, and for continuing to tell the stories that connect people to their communities because ultimately that is what builds us together as a community. So Fire Nasser, Ali Velshi, Zane Velji, thank you so much for spending your time today. Thank you for giving people who thought they were going to have a nice quiet reflection with their chai and nankatai a huge amount of things to think about and thank you for the work you do every single day.
wow, that was so great. My brain is racing and my heart is racing. What a tremendous panel. And thank you again to the panelists uh, for joining us for that magnificent conversation. Did you note though that Ali Velshi never did answer my direct question about the Fire Nasser fan club? I hope you had a chance to catch the pre-show tonight. Uh, you know, I know that all of us feel such pride when we see Ismaili journalists covering the news and there was a great montage of members of the Jamaat who've been working in journalism. Uh, and I know that we are proud of every single one of them and the work that they do representing the community and telling our stories. So as always, it wouldn't be Friday Night Reflections without a great musical expression. And we're gonna go to that right now to lift our spirits. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, clean hands, clear heads, open hearts. See you next Friday on Friday Night Reflections. I love Roshan. विरद करू दम अली अली हर सांस करू बस अली अली तू ही मुर्शिद मेरा अली अली बस अली 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 मैं विरद करू दम अली अली हर सांस करू बस अली अली तू ही मुर्शिद मेरा अली अली बस अली 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 मोमिनो के अमीर है अली अली वलियो के वली है अली अली सखियो के सखी है अली अली बस अली 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 मैं विरत करूं दम अली अली हर सांस करूं बस अली अली तू ही मुर्शिद मेरा अली अली बस अली 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 मैं विरत करूं दम अली अली हर सांस करूं बस अली अली तू ही मुर्शिद मेरा अली अली बस अली 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 तो तेरी झूमता रहूं गली गली अब तो मैं घूमता रहूं इश्क की मंजिल चढ़ता रहूं ओ, 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 मैं विरद करूं दम अली अली हर सांस करूं बस अली अली तू ही मुर्शिद मेरा अली अली बस अली 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 मैं विरद करूं दम अली अली हर सांस करूं बस अली अली तू ही मुर्शिद मेरा अली अली बस अली 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 मुश्किल कुशा है अली अली शेर खुदा है अली अली लापता इला है अली अली बस अली 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 मैं विरत करूं दम अली अली हर सांस करूं बस अली अली तू ही मुर्शिद मेरा अली अली बस अली 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 मैं विरत करूं दम अली अली हर सांस करूं बस अली अली तू ही मुर्शिद मेरा अली अली बस अली 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 तू ही शेर यजदा तू ही तू ही कुत परवर दिगार तीन कबली बस तू ही नबी कबसी बस तू ही तू ही है मेरे आका मौलाए कायना मैं विरद करूं दम अली अली हर सांस करूं बस अली अली तू ही मुर्शिद मेरा अली अली बस अली 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 मैं विरद करूं दम अली अली हर सांस करूं बस अली अली तू ही मुर्शिद मेरा अली अली बस अली 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 मोमिनो के अमीर है अली अली वलियों के वली है अली अली सखियों के सखी है अली अली बस अली 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 मैं विरद करूं दम अली अली हर सांस करूं बस अली अली तू ही मुर्शिद मेरा अली अली 
बस अली 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 मैं विरद करूँ दम अली अली हर सांस करूँ बस अली अली तू ही मुर्शिद मेरा अली अली बस अली अली अली